We're going to go on to Mark chapter um, 3 to start part 2 here. <clears throat> Talking about this sin of blasphemy. You don't hear this talk too much. I think people are a little bit afraid to deal with this particular sin. I've heard all kinds of explanations about that over the years, what that means. And this is in relationship to um, a person that used to be with us in a ministry when we started this deliverance ministry, casting out of devils, healing the sick, preaching the gospel. This person witnessed those miracles. They saw people delivered of powerful spirits. Great testimonies. Some of those people that we worked with 25, close to 30 years ago are still with us today. That's how long they've retained their deliverance. And there are numerous ones that we dealt with. <clears throat> they backslid and lost their testimony. And people always like to point, well, what about so-and-so? How come, you know, they're backslid? Well, Jesus faced the same thing in his day. In fact, he told one person, uh, if you sin again, seven, things are gonna, seven times the worst is going to come, come upon you. So, sure, Jesus faced people getting delivered, getting healed, and losing a deliverance or losing a healing. That's nothing uncommon. It is, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means people don't keep their healing, don't keep their deliverance, or basically what happens to them, they, they meddle around with sin again and they lose everything. I've seen that a lot. And then we've seen, of course, people that maintain and, and keep their healings and their deliverances. <clears throat> so, uh, and then Jesus, we were saying yesterday when he dealt with demon spirits, they didn't always immediately come out when he spoke a word. Sometimes he had to speak two or three words. Sometimes he had to contend a, a short while with certain spirits. And he just, there's just different ways in your Bible that Jesus dealt with. I'm dealing with demonic spirits. And when you cast devils out, a lot of times people get a divine healing, so they just kind of go hand in hand. Because a lot of the spirits that make people cripples and disease are demon spirits. And if you get rid of the demons, the people will be healed. Now that's the truth of the matter. Jesus dealt with these people all the time. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had had a disabling, a disabling spirit, spirit for 18, 18 years. years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. Look! Look, she's cured! It's a miracle! Look, she's cured! And she glorified God. Praise to the Lord! But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which we should work, so come on one of those days to be healed, but not on the Sabbath. You hypocrites! Any one of you would untie his ox or his donkey and take it out from the stall to give it water on the Sabbath. Now here is this descendant of Abraham whom Satan has kept in bond. Whom Satan has kept in bond these 18 years. Should she not be released on the Sabbath? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done. Now that's the truth of the matter. Jesus dealt with these people all the time. Now when he dealt with a man with a withered hand, obviously the hand was useless and he was made whole. The other times he was dealing with people that couldn't speak, they couldn't hear, they couldn't talk, that type of thing. When they were delivered and they could function, their motor could run again. Amen. Now, dealing with this blasphemy spirit, this is the only uh, sin in your Bible that will never be forgiven. And I want to deal with that a little bit because the person I'm referring to is going now up on a a national TV show again and this time they're attacking this the deliverance ministry they, they're attacking casting out of devils how, how stupid it is they're making fun of it they're making light of it well to me that's blasphemy in any measure when you mock what the Spirit of God does now starting out part two here go to Mark chapter 3 uh, if you read chapter 3 all the way up to, chapter, to verse 
30. It's dealing with several things here, but starting out, Jesus was in a synagogue, obviously on the Sabbath. That's when they met on Saturdays. And um, he says there was a man with a withered hand. Now, I was just mentioning that. And, of course, the religious were watching him, as usual. Sounds very familiar, don't it? And it says uh, they watched him whether to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it not lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. They didn't know really how to answer that. And he looked around about them with pleasant smiles. The Joel Osteen smile. Does your Bible say that? When we get these letters in of people saying, well, Jesus was never get mad. He, he's always happy and smiling and he's always, you know, gives us hope. It says he looked upon them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. This is how religious people get. They get so stinking hard, they don't care about anybody getting saved, anybody getting delivered, anybody healed. They just care about their religious shows. He said in the man, stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. There was a miracle done by the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus the man did not do that. The Holy Spirit within Jesus the man did that. It says Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost in the Bible, he, just like we are. He was filled with the Holy Ghost just like us, and then through that power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to preach the gospel cast out devils, do miracles, even walk on water. He did a lot of things through the power of the Holy Ghost. So there you have that. And then it says, Then the Pharisees went forth straightway to counsel that they might find a way to destroy him. They wanted to destroy Jesus for, quote, breaking their religious Sabbath. Here is a man in need. And Jesus looked at him way more important than, you know, if they kept all the, the thing on a, on a day. And all they did on those days, of course, they was reading, as usually in the synagogue, reading the scriptures of those days. And I'm not against that, but dear one, you can't just live on scriptures, bread alone. You've got to have some other things, too. You've got to have some, some movement in your life. You see, if you just eat and eat and eat and never have a bowel movement, you're going to die. So, now, uh, <clears throat> look at verse 10. It says, for he had healed many, insomuch they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. Now again, I was mentioning yesterday, Jesus didn't go around looking for people that had plagues and had diseases and had demons. They were looking for him, you see. And it's the same with salvation. Sure, we're supposed to preach the gospel to all creatures and uh, things like that, but... Um, People that really want to be saved and really want to be healed and really want to be delivered, they'll come, they'll come to you and come seeking you out. This is how we operated when we started in this. We let, opened up the public and we let people come to us. And there was times in our ministries we had sometimes a hundred people in a room. It wasn't a big room, but it was crowded. And as you will see, we're posting this up on the YouTube, our first live deliverance video. You'll see how, you'll hear the noise, how many deliverances are going on simultaneously. Sure, my wife is there, I'm there, and a few workers are there, but all, the whole room was full of people working in deliverance and being worked on. Now, everybody, our enemies like to accuse us that me and General are power hungry. We want to take the whole show. Well, in that video, you'll see that we weren't taking the whole show. There were people that we had trained up. To work in deliverance and had the power of God in those days that were casting devils out. It wasn't just her and I doing everything. Amen. In fact, we're kind of in the background in there. In fact, my face is not even shown in that video. All you see is my hand. My wife is going to get a side view of her real quick. So we don't we take the show. But anyway, um, 11 unclean spirits, when they saw him fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And then he went on there and jumping on down to verse 22 to 30. Now here you have the scribes. 
which came down from Jerusalem, said, He has Bezalibub, that means the prince of the devils, and by the prince of the devils casts he out these devils. Okay, there is your blasphemy. There it is right there. Ever, that sin of bla our, our, the sin of blasphemy is the only unpardonable sin you'll find, and it's always connected with casting out of devils. That's it's, every time. So when people mock deliverance, when they speak ill about deliverance, they're blaspheming the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Now I know there's fake healers and there's fake deliverances, and when we mock them, we have a total right to do it. Some of them are jerks, and some of it is totally fake and pretentious. But I know the difference between someone that's really doing it and someone faking it, or someone getting deliverance. But you've got to be careful that you don't attribute, even if it's fakery, in the behalf of a person doing it or receiving it, you've got to make sure you don't blaspheme the power of that spirit, of the Holy Spirit himself. This is where the danger lies. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> going on down, and then he talks about verse 28. All sin shall be given unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. You can blaspheme men. They were blaspheming Jesus. They said, you're not the Messiah. You know, you're this. But when they blasphemed the Holy Ghost, when they saw Jesus heal a man with the power of God, they was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And when demons were cast out and plagues were healed by the power of God, and they saw that with their eyes, and they said, well, that's the power of the devil. That's when they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now that is the right context here. Eternal damnation. Now there's several words in, in your concordance of eternal. One of the words means well, one of the def definitions mean a duration of time. In other words, you could find scriptures in your Bible when it says forever, but it doesn't mean forever in a sense of endlessness. Here you have the word in its right context, endlessness. There's no end. This is a continued duration of time, never ending, eternal damnation. Now, <coughs> uh, didn't mention anything about the Sadducees here. It was the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus dealt with the scribes and Pharisees. Why did he, and other, we're going to go over here in a minute, he dealt with the Pharisees. Why the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees believed in the afterlife. The Sadducees did not. So when he was talking to the Pharisees about eternal damnation, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew about hell. They believed in the afterlife. They believed in immortality. That's was a big contention with Paul when he got the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees fighting against each other. When he was on trial, he divided them because he was sided with the Pharisees because they believed what he believed. So here he's dealing with that because they knew about eternal damnation. But they said, he hath an unclean spirit or you have a devil. Now, go to Matthew 12 where we were yesterday. Again, if you go back and read up to, to where we're at in their uh, 31, 32. But let's just look at uh, verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch as the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Now those things affected the people's body. You say, well, I don't believe that a Christian can have a devil. Now, we don't have a problem believing pagans can have devils. But when you say a Christian can have a devil, they say, well, that's just heresy. That's just not biblical theology. I mean, that's just wrong. Who says it's wrong? I mean, who says Christians are not blind, can't hear, can't talk, have cancers, die of all kinds of diseases? What are those things? Those are the same things Jesus dealt with. Those are demons. As a professing Christian, don't tell me Christians can't have a devil. I guess what they think in their mind is that these devils that make them slobber and, and you know, peep and mutter and, and scream and carry on and you can't control their bowels and I'm like, all this stuff. Come on. There's all kinds of demons. In my teachings, 
that we had so much time with trouble, trouble with in the early days, trying to tell people, especially over radio, over religious radio, there is a difference between demonization and demon possession, and they just could not connect the dots. Every time we would put forth a radio program, our phone would ring off the hook, calling us everything from A to Z. Telling us we was going to go to hell, taking away people's hope. We were liars, we were deceivers, we was this, that, and the other. Just because they couldn't understand about the difference between demonization and demon possession. I have never taught demon Christians, and I'm using that in a real sense of the word, a true Christian cannot be demon possessed. That's stupid. But a Christian, a real one, can possess a demon. How about it could be a demon of infirmity that could be cast out and that, that infirmity could be healed. We say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But they think I'm teaching Christians can be demon possessed. That's how dumb people have got out there. Spare me, sweetie. Read your Bible for a change. Look up the word demonization in your Greek and see what it says. And look up the word possession and see what it says. I don't think people even study their Bibles. They don't even take these words serious. They don't even research them. Okay, well, he healed that. And said people were amazed. But the Pharisees heard it. They said this fellow did not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Here they go again. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom is divided against itself. You know that whole saying there about, now coming on down to verse 29, about the strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Well, come on. The house he's talking about is people that are housing demons. And the strong men are devils. You gotta, <clears throat> you gotta bind the devils and then cast them out. I mean, Christians are literally demonized, uh, clean up to the top. I would almost say they're on borderline of demon possession. <laughs> They've lost their true Christianity. Now some of them are. I would say some of these evangelists out there are demon. They're working, and I'm not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. They are working under the power of demon power because. Their theology is really screwed up. Now that will show you some things. They don't even teach what the Bible is teaching on some of this stuff. I know the difference between the real Holy Ghost and some fake jerk performing thing. Look, the pagan world can do these miracles too. Pagans can perform miracles just like born again Christians can, just like Jesus. Pharaoh's sorcerers could do just what Moses was doing. Come on, there's a, there's a counterfeit, there's a fake. The occult world is real. They do the same things that Christians can do. But does it mean that those people are real with God performing them? No, there's, there's agents and servants of Satan. So you've got to watch who's performing these things to know who is really behind the power of it. Half the stuff performed these days, all, you see these churches, people flopping around on the ground and, and jerking up and down and acting stupid and, you know, wallowing and whirling all the floor and, and carrying on. Those are demon spirits. They're not casting them out. They're supposed to be being slain in the spirit. And all the time they're doing all these antics and flopping around, carrying on. Come on, you're supposed to be getting demons out of people, not putting them into people. There are such a thing as transferring a spirit. A minister that is really of the devil can put his hand on you and you can receive those devils. And you think, oh, I just got filled with the Holy Ghost. Half the 90% of the church is full of the devil. Called thinking they got the Holy Ghost. Look, the Charismatics, especially Charismatics and Pentecost, are supposed to be the top of the line, cream of the crop in in church land. They have gone so far into the demonic realm that uh, you can't trust anything goes on in there. When they're supposed to be casting devils out, they're giving people devils. That's how bad it's got. I know I've been around these groups. I've seen this thing work. We've dealt with hundreds of people that got demons put into them by some minister laying hands on them and we've cast the devils even sometime named after that minister. You'll find a lot of things, dear one, when you hear demons I don't converse with demons, but I've heard plenty coming out of demons. Now he said, well, they always lie. Demons can tell the truth. Did they lie about Jesus when they said he was the son of God? That was not a lie. They knew he was the son of God. They blurted it out. So demons have 
the capability of telling the truth, but they are liars. All right. To cut this short, in verse 31 and 32, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Now, I could, you, could, you could look at that two ways as I was trying to explain yesterday. In the world to come, that was, a, that was a saying in Judaism of that day. I mean, you find it quite often about, and even in the Old Testament, about the world to come. And it didn't mean always way out somewhere at the end of the world. It was just an expression. Like, I'll see, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, you know, when you say that, do you always see that person tomorrow? It's just an expression, I'll see you tomorrow, or something like that. Those are idioms, American idioms or American expressions. You know, we have a lot of those kind of sayings. So, uh, at the end of the world, or the world to come, that was just an ex expression. But in Jesus, did he really mean that? Well, stutter, studying some of the scholars on this, of course, there's, like I said, debates on that. I'm convinced that what Jesus meant, he meant two things. The world to come, he was, he was operating, you realize, in the world in Judaism. That was the world he worked in. He was not working in the Christian world. It had not arrived. He was bringing it in. It had not been there. It, don't, it didn't come in until the day of Pentecost. We would put on the counter the Christian era started that day. When the, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, we would say that's the day when Christianity really did arrive. So Jesus was operating from the world of Judaism, of what they knew about God and, and, and all this stuff. And in the world to come, was he speaking about what he was bringing in, a new dispensation where, where that world would be a Christian world and it would not be Judaism only, but it would be Christian. I think it had to do with some of that. But in the bigger picture, speaking to the Pharisees about eternal damnation, he was talking about also the big picture at the end of the world, all the world to come, which, which meant the new heaven, the new earth, the people that survive that will be there. And of course, the people in damnation hellfire, that's the world for them. He made a point there, as we've already read, about eternal damnation. He was talking about, if we was going to use the terminology you find in your New Testament, out of the Gospels there, the lake of fire. Gehana, the lake of fire. Not Hades, but Gehana, the lake of fire. That's what he was talking about, the world to come eternal damnation, that's the place, that's the world that sinners are going to occupy. That's their world for eternity. That's the world to come, and the Pharisees knew that because they believed in the afterlife. They believed in the eternal damnation. That's why he was mentioning it to them. The Sadducees did not. They're not even in the picture here. Okay. Um, then he goes on to talk about the good tree and all that. <clears throat> Now, back to this business that's coming up on the YouTube. This would be my only time probably talk about this, but I, I, I need to do this because it's a good opening up for what I'm teaching here. They're complaining that we think the generals have this authority. And it's stuck in this person's crawl that we had authority to cast out the devil out of this person's husband in those days. And that husband is sitting right in front of me right now. How many years is it now? Wow, 32 years. And Colonel Phil is still here. 32 years. My wife, in 1980, just spoke a word. We didn't even go there for deliverance. Just spoke the word and told the devils, two devils, of rebellion and rejection to leave. And she is talking about that on this show, how I escaped that evil cult. Escaping Evil on the Biography Channel coming up March the 24th. I think today she gives her pitiful speech about it. And she's mentioning that that he fell on the floor and was writhing all over the place like a serpent and carrying on. It was none of those things. Sure, he wept and cried because he got saved at the same time. He got demons cast out and he couldn't get rid of those things. But it was not a big show. 
So it's stuck in her crawl for 32 years that her husband's free and she's demon possessed. She is possessed and now she's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now she's mocking the ideal that it was just a fluke. She doesn't even believe in deliverance. She doesn't even believe in God. Last we heard she was serving some bald head female, probably a lesbian, Buddhist. I don't even know if she even believes that now. But beside of that, here's what you got here. Uh, Colonel Philip is here. Clark is sitting here. He got his deliverance. And you'll hear that on the YouTube there. It's CD, but you'll have a lot of footage behind that. You can hear us casting devils out of that. Pretty foul language. He's sitting right there in front of me. Uh, how many years has that been? 1984. Do some mathematics. Quick, quick, quick. How many years? 28. 29, thank you for the right. <laughs> well, anyway, he's not 29 years old, but he got, he's 29 years ago. He, him and Philip are sitting there, and you'll see that up on, or hear it on YouTube. Colonel Philip's giving his testimony. You can hear Clark's uh, testimony, and then his deliverance. And when we played Clark's deliverance on KFIA radio, and John, the homosexual, got delivered, they kicked us off. Just like the Pharisees. They kicked us off. They didn't want to believe that a Christian could have a devil. Both Clark and John, or the other John, were born again Christians when the devils were cast out of them. They weren't pagans. I know they had fallen back into those sins off and on, but at the time we cast devils out of them, they had been restored, got back to God, and we would say they were Christians at the time we were casting devils out of them. Okay, so that throws their little theory away. And uh, like I've said before, when people were condemning us for teaching that, the biggest church in that city, uh, one of their youth that went there wanted to come over and get delivered from us, and they said, that's stupid. Those generals can't cast devils out of you. I mean, that's stupid. There's no such thing. But you know what happened to that kid? He committed suicide. He could have been saved. He could have been delivered. But that big church, oh, big Pentecostal church, oh, the biggest church in Sacramento, California, oh, a prominent leader there. Idiot. Didn't even believe in deliverance. So the kid committed suicide. I could tell you a lot of spook stories on there, but that's really bad. Back to this authority. Matthew 7, 29, Jesus taught with authority, it says. He taught with authority. Not like the scribes, but he taught with someone that had authority. Where did he get it? He got it from the power of the Holy Ghost. Luke 22, 20, verse 2, there was asking him, by what authority do you do these things? Well, Jesus says, I do it by the power of the Holy Ghost, not by demons. But they wanted to know how he did this. Where did this man get this authority? Luke 9.1. I'm quoting that. He called in his 12 disciples together and gave them authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So, when this poor, pathetic lady says, they think they got authority, what? Of course we got authority. If you don't have it, then you're not a true Christian. You're supposed to have authority for God's sake. What are you a Christian for if you don't have authority over demons? Good God, playing church, playing house. As if we're not supposed to have authority as Christians. What are you supposed to be like Joel Osteen, get up there and twitch his nose and act real cute and give a little pet talk. It's not even a scripture with it. And his salvation prayer is so quick you can bat an eye, it's gone. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what do we do then to be saved? What shall we do? Peter replied, Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Come on, man, what authority? You gotta have authority over these devils. They're everywhere, friend. I'm not kidding you, they are bad these days. And they're getting worse, too. We're supposed to have authority. Well, they think they had authority over that devil. Well, of course we had authority over it. Jesus had it. He gave it to his disciples. He gives it to us. And in Titus 2.15, we're to speak, exhort, <coughs> rebuke with all, all authority. authority. All authority. You're not supposed to be a mealy mouth, thumb-sucking, pamper-wearing pervert. What, what do you do in church out there anywhere, you church eyes?
Well, I know what you don't do. You don't cast out devils. You don't heal the sick. You don't speak in tongues. You don't do anything. The Bible says that's what you don't do. If you do speak in tongues, it's definitely of the devil these days because the Spirit of God has departed from 99% of the churches called church out there. They're so full of the devil. And I do really, honest to God, mean that. <clears throat> All right. Now, what about the Old Testament? Was there a sin against blaspheming the Spirit of God in those days? Well, let me quote a couple of things to you. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a naive or a, sword, a native or sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has spoken his or broken his commandment, that person shall be entirely cut off. Now there's two meanings to the word cut off. There's a nicer word, cut off, meaning, which means you're excommunicated. There's a more harsh word. If Jesus was speaking it, he would the word cut off means killed. You'll find it in your Old Testament, the word cut off literally means to kill. Offenders are to excommunicate them. So, anybody that reviles the Lord, we would say blaspheme the God of those days. They were either excommunicated out of the tribes or out of the, out of the groups of people or they were killed. All right, better wake up over there. <laughs> He's transfixed. <laughs> okay. That's one. Numbers 15, 30, and 31. Let me quote another. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offerings forever. 1 Samuel 3, 14. In Isaiah 22, 14, the Lord of hosts has revealed himself in my ears and this is what he said. Surely this iniquity will not be forgiven you till you die. Says the Lord God of hosts. Now that's, that's kind of like a lightweight thing. But Jesus was not lightweight. When Jesus says if you blast him the Holy Ghost. You ain't going to ever get forgiveness for it. In this life or the world to come. Whether it's in Christianity. The Jews weren't going to get it under Judaism. And he's warning the Christians. They're not going to get it under Christianity. And in the big picture. You're not going to get forgiveness even when you at the end of the world. You're going to go to hell with your sin. That's what he's saying. So there's something very alarming here and arresting about what Jesus is saying. He doesn't cut any corners when he says things. Okay, now, if you read your Revised Standard Version, now we was reading out the King James, your Revised Standard Version kind of makes it a little bit more understandable here. Uh... And it's made to say that the sin against the Son of Man is forgivable. Whereas a sin against the Holy Spirit is not forgivable. I mean it makes it a little bit more plain I think. And uh, then you can look also there in Matthew 10.32 and, uh, 10, and 33. If you want to go to there. Now uh, there's a lot. I've been doing research on this. And I'm going to go a few more minutes because I want to get this over with. When you try to understand this term. There are those that try to make it like. Well that Jesus is talking in riddles or parables. And it's not to be taken literal. So let's not worry about that sin too much. It's just like any other thing. It's a hyperbole, hyperbolic type of thing. It, you know exaggerated. But there's a little bit of truth. But let's not take it too serious. Jesus took it all the way. When he says about eternal damnation. That's exactly what it meant. Just as when he said people that's cut off from the vine is going to be cast away and someone's going to gather up those dead branches and going to cast them into the Gehenna. He, that's exactly what he meant. They're going to be thrown into hell. You can't misunderstand that. Well, it's not a parable. So I don't think this is a parable about this. And then other people say, well, the Pharisees really didn't have an understanding of all this. Well, I grant you, they didn't have an understanding of this. Neither did his disciples have an understanding of this. So they're making an excuse that the Pharisees, the scribes, and all those people, 
were ignorant of what Jesus was saying, ignorant about calling Jesus Beelzebub. And I mean, Jesus would just kind of like smack them on the hand, but not really going to kick them into hell type thing. And they're making excuses. And then they say, well, you know, this is scholars I've been reading. Well, you know, the Holy Ghost really didn't come in until the day of Pentecost. And then had that been done after that, then it would be understandable. Dear one, get serious here. The Holy Ghost was the same whether it was before Pentecost or, or during the time or after. What changed the Holy Ghost in Jesus' day if it came, if it was in his day, gave him power to cast out devils, he gave his disciples to cast out devils and heal all, heal all manners of diseases by the same Holy Ghost. What's the difference between that power and the power of Pentecost? It's the same power. It's the same Holy Ghost. Nothing has changed. The Holy Ghost hasn't changed at all. So you can't give me that excuse that, you know, it was a different type of Holy Ghost. This is how they try to reason. So these, are, these are liberals that spend too much time in the bathhouses playing dirty and then want to get away with their sins. Come on, this is where these, these pipe-sucking, porno-watching, filthy, perverted scholars live. I know some of these kind of characters that... <laughs> They try everything in the book to dismiss what Jesus says about the real issue. The real issue is if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost the way this woman's doing, anybody else does it, and attribute the, the power of God to demons, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Pure and simple. Now, if a person of witchcraft cast out a devil and they're capable of doing that, you can say, well, they're of the devil. <laughs> they're of the devil. They did it by the power of the devil. But when they're saying Jesus or Jesus' disciples or us, doing that under the power of God when we're using his name we're not using the name of Buddha or the name of Muhammad or any other name out there we're using the name of Jesus make no mistake when demons come out that's who you believe in and people's always writing us why do you people always use the name of Jesus why don't you use the name Yahweh because I'm not Jewish I'm English got it I have never once cast out a devil in the name of Yahweh or Jehovah or any other of those wonderful names that, that you, that's in your Bible. Jesus' name has the power of God. And I've asked these people, well, haven't you ever cast out a devil in his name or healed the sick in his name? The Bible tells us whatever you do in name and deed, do it in his name. He didn't say nothing about Yahweh or Jehovah or none of those. What's it wrong with the name Jesus? For well, some reason, they just got it stuck in their rear end that the name of Jesus ain't got no power. Ain't got no power. Ain't got no power. You like my English? Ain't got no power. It's got all the power in heaven and earth because all authority was given to him. Matthew 28, 19. All power in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ and he is sharing that power with his true believers. Got it? So, of course, we're supposed to have authority. Of course, we should cast out devils. Of course, we can heal the sick. And not everybody you deal with gets devils cast out. Not everybody we pray for gets healed. It didn't happen in Jesus' day. Jesus went to his own hometown, and he said he only healed a few sick folk because he didn't believe in them. I'm talking about you got to believe in this thing. Do you remember the seven sons of Siva? They was trying to cast the devil out of a man and they was trying to say, well, I'm casting him out in the name that Paul uses. Well, they didn't have that name. They weren't familiar with the name of Jesus. They say, well, I saw Paul do it, so he must have some sort of power. They said the name that Paul uses. Well, you know what happened to those guys? Someone tell me what happened to the seven sons of Siva. Seven people tried to cast out the devil of one person. What happened to them? Oh, it said the demon attacked them. Oh, tore the clothes off. Woo, hey, say, Bruce. <laughs> Must have been having a homo orgy, probably a homo devil. Tore their clothes off and left them bleeding, and the demon didn't get cast out. We try to cast devils out of certain people, we, we couldn't do it, and it's not because we didn't have the power, and I'll tell you why, because people didn't really want it. You say, Well, I don't believe that. You better believe it. You get into this kind of work, you'll come up against anything out there. We was working with a woman who had a definite sex problem. Somebody knows who I'm talking about. She would go to church, church and seduce young Christians, men, to fornicate. That was her ministry. And she was coming to our ministry. I think she was trying to seduce me in a way. That's why I kept pretty close to my wife. But 
she was trying to seduce some of the guys, and she finally said, well, I need some deliverance, and of course you need deliverance. When we got right down to that sexual devil, she, the devil in her was, was pleading with us. You should hear some of these devils plead with you when they're ready to be cast out. It isn't the people speaking, it's demons. Demons do talk, you know. And that devil was pleading with her, with, with us, not to be cast out. And then the woman was pleading with us, out of her humanness, not to cast out. Because she says, you told my wife, now if you cast the devil out, I won't have any more power. So we didn't cast the devil out. I don't know whatever happened to that lady. She probably went on and died of age or something. Who knows what happened to her. But we run across these kind of things. People do not want certain devils cast out. She say you cast out any devil in me that you are discerned. But don't bother this one. Because if you take this devil, I have no power. She had power over men. She seduced them. In churches. Church whore. Now you don't have to do that anymore. Your pastors, your pastor's wives, if they're married, or if they're same-sexers, they all got the same problems. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, this isn't even just making sense. I don't care if it does or not. Okay, let's see here what I got. Well, I don't have any much more to say on that. I'm not going to ramble on. I'm just letting you know. Deliverance is real. The power of God's real. People need deliverance. Deliverance is available if you want it. We're not playing games with people. In those days, we had every Tom, Dick, and Harry and Harry let Mary come around at X Street. I mean, we had everything coming there. Yes, we saw mighty miracles. We saw people that had $500 a day drug habits instantly, and I mean instantly, in that very minute, get delivered without one single headache or withdrawal. We've seen that on several occasions. That is the power of God. It has nothing to do with Jim Green or Lila Green. It has to do with the power of God. And we've seen people healed of all kinds of diseases and all kinds of things. So it is real and it is still available, dear one. If your church doesn't operate in there, I pity you. Find someone that knows how to do it. And if you can't find anybody, you have the authority. If you just do a little fasting, do a little praying and, and get right with God. Renounce all known sin in your life. You can have power over those devils. You can cast devils out of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's saying, don't tell the story. They're looking at their clocks. They don't. I don't know why I'm looking over here. I'm not going to talk about this guy getting a demon halfway up. <laughs> We've seen all kinds of things coming in our days of deliverance. Some people try to have self-deliverance, get a devil halfway out and start screaming. We had two guys that thought, they sit in our deliverance conference a couple nights and thought, man, I'm an expert. I saw the general, dude, I saw those demons screaming. I saw all this going on. Man, I, we got the power. They was going to try to perform some deliverance several days later in their apartment on somebody. And boy, you talk about spooked out. They called us on the phone. They was in a rage that these demons were chasing us all over this apartment. They was actually hidden under the table on the telephone calling us for help. They was screaming. We got these demons riled up. We can't get them out. What do we do to well, I think we went over there and got rid of the problem, but I'm telling you, friend, you can't sit in two-day conference or spiritual warfare class and, and be an expert. It's taken us years, and we're still learning about this thing. <laughs> Amen. But it is real, and it's available. Amen. All over this apartment, we got these demons riled up. We can't get them out. What do we do? <laughs>